Hi, everyone, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella, my secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. How are you doing tonight, Coco? Um, still doing Sober October. Yeah, how are you hanging in there? Um, it's actually gotten a lot easier. It's like when you're like going through torture and you're just like waiting to die and you're just like, okay, oh. I'm kind of used to it. No, yeah, it's... great analogy for Sober October. <laughs> Sobriety's been tortured. No, it's only been really sucky because my friends are like, oh, I'm like gonna have a bottle and like make spaghetti. And I'm just like, oh, I'll have spaghetti. I'm like, yeah. I'm, uh, right, I know. It's like, I'll eat some more. <laughs> I, I need some sort oh, of vice. Gosh, I've, I've eaten everything Same. this month. I yeah, just... yeah, I'm way hungrier when I'm not, well, that's weird. Yeah, because normally... yeah, no, like I get the drunchies real Yeah, bad. I get the munchies when I'm stoned. <laughs> so you think I would be eating less, but no, because I'm bored. Like normally when I'm bored, I get stoned. So yeah, yeah now like... it's like when I'm bored, I eat. And it's because of quarantine, somewhat quarantine. Like you're like, well, I'm not going to go like spend time at the mall because that's yeah. dangerous. So you're yeah. like, well, I guess I'll just eat again. And then I'll take a nap and then I'll eat again. I'll take a nap. Yeah. <laughs> so that's been Sober October. Binge napping. through a lot of series. Oh gosh, I've watched so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You watched all of the boys. I did in two days. Yeah. No, three days. It three did days. Take three from yeah. season one and two. Yeah. So, I mean, that's been a, a journey. <laughs> no. This will be our last podcast that we're doing uh, for Sober October. Is it? Yeah. Oh, thank God. Which, yeah. Because so. normally I feel like um, me and Donna are real funny when like, because we usually do this podcast with White Claws. Yeah. Um, like some sort of like White Claw knockoffy thing or whatever. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. It just makes it like, e- I, I've gotten used to it. Actually, I'll say it. Since this is our last podcast before Sober October ends, I, I will have this small teaching moment here for myself. Yeah. Is I learned that I didn't necessarily need booze at all to be funny, interesting, entertaining, or um, I didn't even really need it to like get the nerves off. It took a little longer doing it with obviously just like mentally, yeah. like when you walk into a club or whatever, um, or even like hosting introvert or a couple of other things. Like I had to like push yeah. myself really hard to get to that fun mindset to like be entertaining as an entertainer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel that. I, I So I stopped drinking a couple weeks before Sober October and I don't think I'm going to be drinking hard liquor again. Um, I think I might just stick to some wine or seltzers or something like that. But I'm, I'm more of a weed, weed queen. Um, <laughs> weed queen. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's kind of what it taught me is that I don't have to drink in order to, um, you know, partake in this art form and in this lifestyle, I think it's okay just to kind of be chill. Yeah, and, and, it really, <laughs> and it really did show me that it's also kind of nice not waking up groggy. Yeah, like I don't ever really wake up groggy. Yeah, like that. That was kind of cool. Too. I still sleep in, but <laughs> <laughs> but that's because I'm lazy. Um, so what are you wearing tonight, Coco? Oh yeah, so um, I decided to wear, well, it's it's kind of weird. Let me try yeah. to explain it. So it's completely a mask over all of the makeup I put on. Yeah, um, yeah. you're then, beat tonight, yeah, by the way. I seriously, like every time I lift up the mask, like <laughs> beat for the gods. Um, but then underneath it, I was like, you know that like pleather texture that the mask is? Yeah. That's what this whole costume is made out of. Oh, I know it okay. kind of feels weird when it touches <laughs> you, but, and it's mostly just a muumuu from the mask down. Oh, okay. Yeah. I dig it. I dig it. I'm wearing the bikini that Borat wore in the first movie um, (laughs) because I am ready to incriminate the rest of the Trump administration since Giuliani's already been incriminated. Um, (laughs) I I love it. It's so Thank you. Thank you. Right? I know. Like my breastplate, it's just like the straps are covering the two nips. It's really, you know, I feel free in it. Yeah, I understand. Like, I'm wearing an afro, and like the afro is like popping out of the eye holes in the mask. Yeah. But like, it's still chic. I'm wearing an afro from the waist down. <laughs> it's a merkin. <laughs> oh goodness. So um, we are doing part of a series, like we're doing our um, true crime series right now, and we are actually inviting somebody in who is super excited about true crime as well. And yes. before we introduce them, um, please go back to listen to the previous two episodes. Uh, Donna did her retelling. I did my retelling. Um, I think we did a great job with those. And always with the disclaimer that be sure to like, um, be aware that this can be sensitive and hard subjects for everybody. And I know we start off the podcast always fun because it is a drag queen related podcast, yeah. but these are really serious issues. So we would like to welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast, Shandy Evans. 
Hello? Hi, Sandy. Yes, they can hear you. We now. can hear you. Oh, yes. <laughs> What's up, y'all? How are you doing? Oh, we're doing good. We're doing so how good. How are you? How is how has um everything been for you? Oh, um, I mean, you know, it's 2020, so I don't think anyone's doing super hot, but no, you know what? <laughs> not particularly. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny that y'all were actually doing like sober October because I was also gonna do sober October, but with weed. Yeah. Um, but then as the election started getting closer, I was like, I I need my vice. Like, <laughs> trust and That's believe. Rough. Trust and rough. believe. Election night, because I've had a lot of stake in this election. I've been raising a lot of money um, mm -hmm. to fight voter suppression and whatnot lately. So, you know, if things don't go my way, I'm gonna be stoned out of my mind. Oh, bitch! You better believe I'm gonna be blasted as fuck at that fucking protest. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. Seriously, I am going to be drinking from like October 31st, which is my last day of sober October, to like well through that election day. Because yeah. honestly, having to handle like Trump supporters and really mean conservatives, especially after Amy Comey, whatever her name is, getting uh, um, Amy Coney Barrett. Yeah, yeah. that. Uh, yeah, that really, really 48 year old piece of nonsense, um, unqualified <laughs> piece of nonsense. Yes, uh, to the Supreme Court. It's just so much for me, and I was just like, oh god, I want to. First so judge bad. in like I think 150 years to not receive bipartisan support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's wrong. It's really, really wrong. So I'm buckling my seatbelt for the next upcoming months because I, I don't know, I'm just anticipating a lot. So yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I feel yeah. that. Oh, and we wanted to congratulate you on finally getting canceled. Oh, yeah. Thank you, so thank you so much. I was canceled, so Evans. So many people, like, <laughs> at the beginning of the year, like, I really wanted this to be the year that I get canceled, but like it was hard because like I don't want to actually like say anything or do anything like racist or like transphobic or anything like that, you know? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it turns out all I have to do is, you know, ask that people don't get sexually assaulted and then I'm canceled. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so right? crazy how canceled from an anonymous Instagram at that. <laughs> I know. Oh, I know. That was the best fucking part. I read that post like 10 times. I literally, I literally called my mom and I was like, <laughs> maybe she didn't know that I got canceled today. <laughs> oh my God. I love it. <laughs> but, and before we get to your story, we did want to point out some of the things that you've been doing. Like, so we've um, been looking at your series on Instagram. Yeah. Your call to actions, which have been super great. Your makeup skills that you've been doing with your call to actions are super great. And just oh, thank like, you. Everything yeah. like you're doing like for the community and the larger community and for queer people and queer art should always be celebrated, of course. But your series has been so great. So, yeah. so great. And listeners, you can follow oh, Shandy on you. Instagram at Rainbow Whale. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's, that, that's actually it, listeners. It's it is. Not, that wasn't just a joke. It's <laughs> at Rainbow Whale. <laughs> yeah, all one word, right? <laughs> Yeah, how does it say? I think I was like 18, I would say. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mine was Hot Mess Express for a really long time until I changed it to Donatella, my secrets. Oh, that's such a good fucking I had, name. I yeah. had Hot Mess Express as my Instagram. Like, oh, I bitch, had, you could have sold I, that. I know. I should have. <laughs> <laughs> like, my Instagram will forever be Rainbow Whale until someone offers me like a couple thousand for it. So let's go ahead and get into true crime. So the way that, so me and Donna have not actually talked to Shandy about what story that she is going to tell us today. So all of our reactions will be obviously new and mm -hmm. interesting or exciting, or we'll snore if it's boring as hell. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> so we'll see. So, and hopefully Shandy is prepped and ready to go. Oh, okay. That was a great trigger warning and sensitive <laughs> trigger warning for the true crime story <laughs> that we're about to hear. If it's trigger boring, I'll snore. <laughs> Not the story, Shandy, telling it. There's a different. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. But we are going to be dealing with sensitive subject matter. So, listener discretion is advised. Shandy, we're going to hand it over to you. Yes. And I was going to say, that being said, um, the person that was murdered was some like old, like white Hollywood producer. So it's not that bad. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going to be telling y'all the story of William Desmond Taylor. Um, he was a really, really big um, movie producer, director, um, in like early, early, early Hollywood. Um, he was, he like starred in some of the first like motion picture films. He was the president of the Motion Picture Association for a little bit. Um, yeah, just like super rich Hollywood actor guy. And then he was fucking murked. And this is what happened. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> 
So on February 1st, 1922, Taylor's valet, uh, Henry, or no, I lied, I'm sorry, this is February 2nd that this happened. Um, Henry, his valet, um, arrived to make uh, breakfast for Taylor and just kind of do his like normal, like morning stuff that he would do. Cause he was also his like cook and his valet and his assistant and, and like secretary. He was like kind of like the everything kind of guy. Mm -hmm. But plot twist, he came in and didn't make uh, him breakfast because William Desmond Taylor was dead. He was found dead uh, in his apartment uh, face up with blood around his mouth um, and there was no sign of a break-in or a struggle whatsoever at the apartment. Mm -hmm. um, this is also, um, keep in mind, this is uh, back during a time where a lot of murders in Los Angeles and Hollywood went unsolved because you could essentially just go to the police and be like, hey, I got 30 bucks and they'll be like, lit. And then they won't like investigate the crime. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'll talk, and even for like someone like William Desmond Taylor, who he lived in like a really affluent neighborhood, you know, again, big movie producer, made a lot of money. He yeah. probably made like forty dollars a year, which was a lot in the twenties. <laughs> um, so um, Henry, uh, the uh, valet, alerted the neighbors who uh, pretty much all of his neighbors were also like starlets and movie producers and such. Mm -hmm. And once they heard Henry like shouting for help, instead of like anyone actually like calling the police or anything, all of his neighbors just went into his apartment and just started looking around his apartment like as if it was like an open house. <laughs> Um, so yeah so henry henry ended up calling the police because everyone was just like oh look at this like fun attraction that just like popped up by my house um oh my and, like, everyone's contaminating the scene and everything yeah uh, and definitely was, had to contaminate the crime scene a lot yeah oh yeah bitch and if, if you thought that was contamination just wait because we got okay. like intentional contamination coming Damn. up um so after like all these people are just like looking around his apartment, like having like, you know, a good old Sunday, um, the police and the medical examiner finally arrive on scene and they discover that he had been shot in like the lower back, like kind of like lower like abdomen side area. Okay. Uh -huh. um, and one of the weird things that um, the police speculated is that someone was hugging him while he shot him. Oh. That was a very big like thing that the police were putting out. And I just want to say, what the fuck? How, how, yeah. Wait, how does so, that work? If someone's fat, right? I guess if someone was, but like, where would they have put, like, I'm hugging you and then I have to reach back, then shoot in your, because if like, I did it this way, I'd shoot myself. Exactly. It, Why would you me. shoot someone while you're hugging them? That makes no sense. But like, that yeah. was like the big thing that the police at the time were like, you know, aiming. They're like, it has to be someone like close to him because they were hugging him while he shot him. Because really the main thing, the main other main piece of evidence that points to that is that he didn't have any bullet holes in his arm or his sleeve. And because it entered into the side, his arms had to be raised or like back or something. Huh. And so I was, so basically the police were like, someone had to be hugging him, even though like there's 500 million other things that could have happened to make his <laughs> arms raised, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, so moving on, um, oh, also they ruled out the fact that it was a robbery because pretty much like all of his valuables were still there. Like yeah. he saw his Rolex and all his cash in his pocket and all that good stuff. Um, they also found um, a nightgown in his apartment, um, which we will get to a little bit later, mm -hmm. um, along with, um, yeah, pretty much everything. So moving on, Charles Aiton, who was a Paramount Movies executive at the time, visited the crime scene before the police got there and before like anyone had gotten there. Like he just showed up the next morning to like go around the apartment and no one really knows exactly what he did there. But it's very highly speculated that he got rid of a lot of like embarrassing personal files as well as planted um. some fake evidence. Because at the time, um, it wasn't uncommon for Paramount and other like major movie studios to play major parts in or major influences in uh, their actors' lives because they wanted to uphold like a certain image, right? Mm -hmm. Like they really wanted to keep their reputation. So it wasn't uncommon for them to kind of like tamper with stuff like this. I've actually heard about that. Like even in death, for some reason, like, cause it's like your, so like if somebody died, you would actually go in there and make like, say they died in a really promiscuous situation. Like they were naked or like, let's say they were, you know, some sexual act or whatever, they would actually 
put them back in a bed. They would put clothes on them. They would like make the whole scene pretty before mm -hmm. they would actually call the police just because the, they didn't want the reputation of the person to be like tarnished. Tarnished. And I thought, I always thought that that was insanely interesting that even in death, like, I mean, I know it must be a bond or friendship or something like that. And you don't want your friend's name to be tarnished, but it was always really interesting because you just contaminated an entire scene. Yeah. To a degree. Yeah. Like you potentially could have you, you stopped this crime from being solved because you wanted yeah. to uphold some sort of image with them. And also quick side note, if I ever die and y'all find me and I'm uggo as fuck, y'all better put some wing liner on me or something to make me look cute when I die. <laughs> Trust me. You know, For on real. that note, on that note, um, I needed to, I forgot to ask cause you know, I'm a bad person, but Donna, how are you doing this evening? Oh, you know what? I'll let you know after this brief commercial break. Hey all you beauties, this is Manhattan Brown, Eugene's bearded lady, with a special message. Do you love podcasting queers, queer issues and themes? Well check out Queer With Attitude on your podcast app for a new obsession that focuses on tearing down the societal norms in the LGBTQIA plus community with weekly guests, creative writing, and a special cocktail of the week designed by mixologist Brian Peterson. You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and other podcasting apps, or you can check us out at anchor.fm backslash queer with attitude to see where to find us and to become a monthly sponsor. Join the queer revolution to educate, create, and inspire. It's a podcast Check it out. with Coco and Donna Telepodcast. Tune into what they tell you podcast Check it out. with Coco and Donna Tell a podcast. Check it out. I am feeling quite good. You know what? I love having Shandy Evans on as our guest. She just scalped herself. Uh, we're watching her right now. <laughs> <laughs> and Shandy, I will definitely wing your liner if we find your body in a compromising position. Also, we'll definitely use the photo of you with the dildo on your head as the photo of you missing if you ever go missing. Because that's very flattering and it's your canceled photo. I mean, yeah, I was going to say, I need everyone to know what a dick I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it'll be so weird when it gets printed in media and it'll be all blurred. People are like, wow, they couldn't have found a better picture. I'd be like, no, we had tons. We just wanted that one yeah that was the one <laughs> i'm actually gonna write it in my journal now that when i die to use that photo specifically uh -huh. so be like this is what he, this is what he wanted before he died. <laughs> <laughs> this is my wishes. i dig it <laughs> so bring us back into your story shandy all right so we left off and the paramount people executives were essentially tampering the crime scene to make Taylor not look so bad. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of reasons for that that we're going to get into in a little bit. Um, but first, let's go ahead and go over the timeline of the night. So first, uh, at 7.45 p.m., Mabel Norman, who was a silent movie actress at the time, super famous for like being essentially one of the only female comedians in silent film, at least at that time, mm -hmm. um, leaves Desmond Taylor's apartment and is the last person to ever see him alive. Uh, and it's also rumored that they were like getting a little like frisky. Oh. Um, <laughs> but um, it's also rumored that Mabel may have been a beard, but we'll get into that. Uh, okay. in a little bit. Oh. All right. Um, so Mabel Norman's last person to see him in the live at eight o'clock, multiple neighbors hear what they think is a gunshot go off but they just kind of wrote it off as like, you know, like a car backfiring or like mm -hmm. out of city sounds, you know, they lived in LA. So they heard like the one gunshot and didn't hear anything following. So they were like, okay, no biggie. However, um, just a couple minutes after that, one of the neighbors was uh, looking out of her window and saw a man leaving Taylor's apartment. Um, she described the man, he was about 5'9", clean shaven and dressed very nice. Um, and the man actually acknowledged the neighbor. The neighbor, he saw her looking at him, um, and he just kind of turned back to the apartment and closed the door and then walked away as if like nothing was wrong. So the neighbor was like, okay, like maybe it's just like a friend or something. Cause mm -hmm. you know, he saw me peeping Tom in at him and didn't do anything. Yeah. Right. Then at 8.15 PM, 
um, just like a couple minutes after this dude leaves, um, Henry, uh, Taylor's chauffeur and everything, parks his car in the garage. And when he goes to return the keys to Taylor, the front door is locked. Mm-hmm. And he's knocking and no one's responding, even though the lights are on inside. And so the chauffeur just kind of like assumed that he was like in the shower or something and just like left and like, you know, no biggie. Mm-hmm. However, um, because um, Taylor's body was found directly next to the front door, um, it's assumed that at this time, Taylor had already been murdered. Yeah. Oh, geez. Um, and then we're going to rewind a little bit um, to 6 p.m. because a couple days later, the police were interviewing these two men and they said that there was a man matching the description of the neighbor's description of a man leaving the apartment that asked the two men at a gas station where Taylor lived. And that gas station was only like a couple blocks down from where he lived. Oh, wow. Hmm. Also, shout out to like the 20s when you could just like go up to someone and be like, hey, hey, buddy, you know where Taylor lives? And they're like, yeah, Taylor lives <laughs> yeah. right the road. Right like, over <laughs> here. <laughs> know exactly <laughs> who you're talking about. <laughs> How come I can also, imagine remember, wasn't there like a period of time where you could just like go to the DMV and like ask for someone's address? Wasn't that a thing? Probably. Or you I could like doubt it. Or get it from the operator. Like yeah. operator, can I like ba 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 ba? Like and two, like, like, oh yeah, this is how you get to this person you want to like kill and murder. Yeah. <laughs> People were a lot more, like, more trusting people. back then, you know. And they really were. Aware. Like, and I also, that's why there was, like, so, I mean, there's a lot of murders now, too, but I feel like that's yeah. why everyone was getting murdered in, like, the 20s and, uh, in the 20s and the 70s. 70s. I was going to say the yeah. 70s. People hitchhiked Every everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, I would hear the stories and it would be like, well, she heard a knock on her door at 1 a.m. and was concerned. And so she opened the door and it's like, yeah, what, what do you think is going to happen to you if you open your door at 1 a.m., Mary? Nothing right? Good yeah, happen. seriously. Nothing good <laughs> happens after 1 a.m. when a stranger knocks at the door, you know? <laughs> That's why you normally hear true crime stories nowadays. They're like, well, the fifth house she knocked on after she was stabbed finally answered. <laughs> yeah. Because those first four houses were like, oh, no. That's, not no. Not. They even look out, they're like, eh, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, um... A couple of things that happened before, uh, so also, sorry, so establishing a little more of the timeline, um, we're going to rewind even further to 1921, near the end of the year, where Taylor was receiving a lot of weird phone calls. Um, Hmm. Like, he received a really large influx of phone calls where he would pick up and no one was on the other end. It was just someone, like, breathing or, like, some shit. Some, like, full, like, scary movie shit. Gosh, that's every horror movie ever. Ugh. I know, like, I'm just saying, like, if someone ever called my phone and I just heard breathing, smash the phone, move away, get a new phone, get a new idea. Like, <laughs> like, that's an omen, girl. Right? <laughs> that is an omen. Um, and then he also, uh, his home was also robbed during this uh, series of phone calls. Um, and uh, I don't think anything, like, super, super important happened. Um but also during this time, he received a package, a mysterious package, which leads us into our first suspect of who killed William Desmond Taylor. Are you ready? Yes. Lay it on us. I'm ready. The first suspect is Edward F. Sand. Okay. So Edward was um, Taylor's former secretary slash valet slash everything. Okay. Um, and they did not have a good history, Mama. They were not friends. They were not good Judies. They weren't even frenemies. They just fully hated each other. Okay. Um, and for fair reason, um, Edward Sands forged over $5,000 in checks and also stole jewelry from William Desmond Taylor oh my while God. he was working for him. Um, and Desmond Taylor actually voiced um, how bad he wanted to kill him for stealing from him um, just a couple days before he died himself. Wow. Wow. Um, and then uh, basically the two had a grudge, huge, huge grudge, like fucking hate each other for a really long time, which led um, Edward Sands to hire a PI so that would just like dig up any, you know, possible like incredulous shit on William Desmond Taylor. And to his surprise, William Desmond Taylor was not William Desmond Taylor. William Desmond Taylor was really William D. Taylor. What? And that motherfucker changed his name and lied about who he was the whole time he was in Hollywood, bitch. Oh, oh my gosh. God. What yes. was he hiding? What was he? Why did he change his name? 
Ooh, we'll get into that in just a second. Um, so to go back to the package that Taylor sent him, um, Taylor sent him a package that contained a receipt from a pawn shop. Uh -huh. um, and the receipt was basically a receipt for the jewelry that Sands had stolen from Taylor and sold to the pawn shop. And the name on the receipt was signed with Taylor's actual name. Hmm. And so he sent that <laughs> to William Desmond Taylor to be like, bitch, not only did I you steal all of your jewelry, but I know your fucking secret, bitch. Yeah. And he also left him a note that wrote, um, so sorry to inconvenience you even temporarily. Also, observe the lesson of the forced sale of your assets. A Merry Christmas and a happy and prosperous new year. And the note was signed Jimmy V, which was, uh, it's apparently a reference to like an old, uh, thief movie where the thief evades police. Um, hmm. So yeah, this like, bitch like yikes. fully uncovered all this shit and like sent him a package like not too long before he died, like letting him know I know all of the tea. This is the real tea of PDX, honey. Right <laughs> and, so, and it is that you are William Dean Tanner. Um, so basically, before he changed his name, the reason he changed his name is because. Before he moved to Hollywood, he was living in New York City, um, and he had started and deserted a family in New oh, York. Ooh. Yikes. Yeah, I think so, he had two children with this woman, and basically just like, wh whose name I couldn't find, um, and Jess was like, yeah, was like, bye, I'm going to be a producer in Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> just like on the other side of the country. That So, so small pause here the stuff's like that when I hear that story like when somebody because you know we've all seen it in the movies where somebody left to re, you know they left their family to start a new family or something like that I'm like where does someone get the capital to just leave their home state all their possessions and everything like that to go just get started someone else, somewhere else like you have to really want to leave to do that <laughs> I also feel like it's 10 times harder to do that now than it oh, was like sure. back in the 20s. Like, I feel like back in the 20s, you could have just like gotten a crayon and some paper and made yourself a full new identity and everyone right. would have believed you, you know? <laughs> right. I mean, that's why <laughs> so, um, well. even today, our social security cards are just these really crappy pieces of paper that we sign. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, hope they don't get stolen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, God. So, so yeah, so he dipped on that family and um, he kept that secret for, he actually kept that secret until after he died um, to try, because that was actually something that came up after he died. Um, and he kept that just to, like, again, to preserve his reputation and all that other stuff. There's also evidence that um, Sands may have potentially found out that uh, Taylor was a homosexual yeah. um, but we'll get into that in a little bit because that's also some that's its own tea um, I'd also like to point out the police never questioned Sands even though he was the number one suspect weird what the yeah so because he didn't live in Hollywood I think he lived in like Nevada or some shit um, they tried luring him to get to LA but like it didn't work and so they just like never pursued it Huh. I mean, like that. Let's just be real. Like, say he's the murderer, being like, "Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I don't need to go that way. I have no business there. I'm good." <laughs> I mean, honestly, like, if you are a murderer and you get a sudden call to come to the town where you murdered someone in, don't go, Mary. Yeah. You didn't win a free cruise. Okay, yeah. you're winning a lifetime in jail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is Shandy's dickhead rules of true crime. If you are being called to a city where you murdered someone. <laughs> Do not go. <laughs> it was like I see like you know those videos where they like catch pedophiles and stuff, which like thank God they're catching them. But yeah. it's like, girl, you literally they told you you won ten million dollars and you have to like walk to this like abandoned fucking like building in the middle of nowhere. Like, come on, girl, you deserve to yeah. get caught. Yeah, yeah I mean, right. you deserve to get caught anyway. You shouldn't be a pedophile, but you know. Yeah, see. I digress. <laughs> this is my platform here now. I hate pedophiles. Yes. <laughs> <I hate that. laughs> um, so yeah so the police never questioned him it is also important to note that there is no direct evidence linking him to the crime um but i would also like to remind you that like 20 fucking people looked in his apartment and were like dicking around in there before right. he showed up so yeah who knows what kind of evidence got lost or even fully like stolen yeah. um 
So yeah, that's about it for Taylor or for um, the case of Edward Sands. Really big grudge, knew a whole lot of dirty shit on Taylor. Um, and I think that it was just, it's potentially a case where Taylor got to William or where Sands got to Taylor before William. Yeah. Got to him. Did that make sense? I hope that made sense. There's yeah. a lot of old tiny names. <laughs> I'm trying to keep track of. <laughs> Um, so the next uh, potential suspect is Mabel Norman, who is the silent actress. film actress. Yeah. Um, so basically, so she was the last person to see Taylor alive. Um, and at that, she, the last time she saw him was literally like 10 minutes before he got shot. Hmm. Um, which could mean that it was her, but it could also mean that whoever killed him was like, you know, staking out the house, you know? Yeah. Um, it was rumored that they were seeing each other, um, and when William Taylor Desmond died, he had um, a locket in his pocket with a picture of Mabel in it. Hmm. Um, and she yeah. also, uh, sorry, what? I said you don't have pictures of your friends in. Well, it's the twenties. I don't know. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I don't even think I have a locket, and I think if I did, I wouldn't put like. I don't know. I feel like I put like my mom in it or something. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> right. Not just a close friend. Yeah. I I'm sure I don't I'm kind of interested in the beard theory because I'm I'm interested to see what his other interpersonal relationships were like. Mm. Oh, how did, she she was all over Hollywood. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and she had the money to get her covered up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See. Um, so she also admitted that she wrote um like tons and tons and tons of love letters to Desmond Taylor. Um, uh, however, they were not found at his house. And I think that they, that that was some of the evidence that was removed when Paramount went in there before the police, um, because that could potentially be like salacious or whatever. Yeah. Um, however, she did turn in some of the letters. However, the letters that she turned in didn't incriminate anybody. Huh. Um, when police searched Mabel's house, like nothing really came up. So really, like, she's suspected in that it could be, like, a love gone wrong. But, I don't know, pretty much every, like, crime sign I went on was, like, it was either Mabel or this next bitch. Yeah. Are you ready? <laughs> okay, so I have two more suspects. Okay. So, and I'm actually going to save this next one for last because, I don't know. I think she, I think she did it. I can definitely see this. <laughs> I think she did it. <laughs> I guess. So before I get into Charlotte Shelby, um, I'm going to get into the um, uh, a potential hit that was put out by Paramount. So Ooh. it came out afterwards wow. that Miss William Desmond Taylor uh, knew all of the Hollywood secret sex spots, honey. Yeah. She was... She was at Snippy. She was on Snippies. She was, you know, at the, you know, Griffith Observatory. You know, she, she was very well known. Yeah. Um, and it was found out that Paramount knew this for a really long time. Um, and they, but because Taylor made them so much money, um, they just like never said anything and they just tried to keep it hush hush. Mm -hmm. So that way, like they wouldn't ruin the reputation. Right. Um, and uh, the, the main reason a lot of people suspect this is not only because um, it was known that he would peruse these spots, but the person seen leaving his apartment was, and seen at a gas station was a male. Um, and the, this person doesn't fit the, necessarily fit the description of Edward Sands, his old um, uh, valet, and it does not fit the description of Charlotte Shelby uh, because it's a, she's a woman who's also like five one or five two or some shit. Yeah. So it's thought that either Paramount hired someone to take out Taylor and because he was gay and it was going to be uncovered or yeah. that it was one of his lovers who Taylor was threatening to like uh, essentially out them because they were also like a movie executive or a big time movie person. Yeah. Um, and that other person got to Taylor before he could. Mm, interesting. Um, and that's the reason why they think that the Paramount exec executive went into his apartment before police did to plant evidence of like nightgowns and like all this other stuff. And Paramount also um, not only did that, but they also gave false information to the press claiming that there were pornographic photos of Taylor with women and that he had a lot of female nudie mags 
and that there was tons of women's lingerie oh and just very like trying to be like he's, he's a ladies man yeah he's straight yeah like don't worry no gays here um so yeah. that's like one of like the other main theories is that it was just paramount trying to cover up because you obviously you can't be gay in 1922 so right right but they also don't want to lose out on any money so they just smirked him yeah he was a drag queen that's why he had all that laundry no joke <laughs> oh, full drag you know he tucked it he tucked his meter between his legs put on the nightgown and he fully lip synced to supermodel by rupaul even though it wasn't out yet <laughs> <laughs> so the final subject so i actually think that that's very valid but before we get into the final subject i personally think that that makes a hell of a lot of sense yeah like you know like my because I mean, like, I feel like a lot of people were fucking and doing drugs back in the twenties. I don't think Paramount would have cared that much because, no. like, tons of their stars were getting uncovered for that. However, I one hundred percent think that they would have fully covered up the fact that he was gay. Yeah. Well, and you have to think sure. about it. I mean, I know we live in the society now to where you know queer is becoming a little bit more accepting. Um, but yeah, uh, those reputations of homosexuality, especially in the nineteen twenties, that could have ruined a whole movie. Co- like, people hated gays. Yeah. Like, yeah, that would have ruined your whole movie company. It would. It would have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they were, and also I'm just saying, Willie Desmond Taylor was very fine. So honestly, like that, uh, he can get it. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna have on like... our website. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so the final subject I want to get, or suspect I want to get into, is Charlotte Shelby. So this person, I think in terms of individual people that they've identified makes the most sense. So Charlotte Shelby was the mother of Mary Miles Minster, who was, she was a a huge silent film star at the time. Um, She was like 19, super young, virginal, cute. Um, And Charlotte Shelby was one hell of a backstage mom. She, um, basically the whole reason Mary Minster was a actress is because her mother pushed her into it like very much like from a young age like I want you to be an actress you need to be famous she even went as far as to have Mary steal the identity of a dead cousin and so that way she would appear older on paper and so we have another fake name here Mary's real name was not Mary Mary it was Juliet what (laughs) And her mother, because I think when she first started performing, I think it says she was like 15. Um, and she wanted, her mom wanted to appear older on paper. So she stole her identity of her dead cousin. Wow. Whoa. That's insane. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, and um, Mary was deeply in love with um, uh, uh, with Taylor, uh, with William Desmond Taylor. Uh, constantly wrote letters to him. My favorite letter. <laughs> My favorite letter this bitch wrote to him was, it was something like, you're my love, I love you, blah, blah, blah. X, 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 X. Like nine little X. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Like that shit had me so dead, my fucking wig came off again. Like. So she was fully in love with him. Um, her mother did not approve of this um, for a couple of reasons. Um, first and foremost, um, because Mary Minster was kind of under Charlotte's protection, Charlotte Shelby got all the money, honey. She was fully in charge of the finances, like making all that cash. And so if Mary were to get with William Desmond Taylor and, you know, back in the 20s, you know, women basically just had to co-sign onto a male's life yeah um, right, right and so basically if she did that charlotte charlotte shelley would lose all of her money on top of that charlotte shelley was also super super religious and mm-hmm. uh was angry with taylor because she she was hearing rumors that they slept together and she was like mary needs to say a virgin because that matters yeah <laughs> that matters <laughs> um and so, uh, and, and on top of that, she also threatened to kill Taylor on multiple occasions. Like, she fucking hated this bitch. Oh, wow. Um, and so it's very possible that Charlotte Shelley uh, could have dressed as a man or hired a hitman to murder him. Yeah. Um, and just wanted to take him out because otherwise she would lose her cash cow. Yeah, Wow. exactly. Wow. Damn, there were a lot of people that really hated him. 
Yeah. Yeah, bitch. That's what happens when you're a fucking movie executive in the 20s, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so um, to this day, um, no one knows who killed William Desmond Taylor. Um, he was a closeted gay man who was murdered potentially because he was gay and the network execs wanted to get rid of him. Or it was potentially because someone's a crazy fucking stage mom and didn't want her uh, daughter to be taken away so she would lose all of her money. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, Dang, wow. it's hard. Like, I don't even know which suspect I would like be in line with like to think was the the one that killed him wasn't wasn't like, it like the window was so small like when he was murdered like the like the oh, yeah. events was yeah so very small it was literally like a 30 minute window between mabel leaving his house and the valet showing up and not to no one answering the door um well, how much time was there between when the valet knocked on the door to when he was finally found um it was like 12 hours i think because the valet didn't discover him until the next morning okay you know what though because of the way that the neighbors saw the guy leaving and the way he reacted it makes me think that it was a professional that was doing the job because anyone else who was like not experienced would have been shocked or kind of like spooked in that moment um, ha- seeing someone witness what they just witnessed, but mm-hmm. the person calmly reacted and kind of just shut the door and walked away. It makes me think that it was someone who, who had done this before. Maybe it was the movie studio because they were like, you know, we can't shut down because we have a queer mo. Um, mm-hmm. But it's easier to fire someone than have them. Well, I guess no. I mean, back in those days, if you would have fired somebody and they decided to come out of the closet, that would have done more damage for you too, um, because you had this homosexual working for you. Well, and all their works mm-hmm. too. You know, yeah, that's their, their legacy work. is that they were. Huh. Yeah. Maybe it was the movie. It was the movie studio. I think I honestly, personally think it was the movie studio. Yeah. Like I think it was either the movie studio or his old assistant, Edward Sands. I think that those are like the most likely, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, but part of me just feels like Sands just wanted to fuck with him. I don't think Sands actually wanted yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, I could see that too, especially with him not living in the state too. Because was he not living in the state at the time either? No. Okay. Yeah. No, once he got once he got fired, I think he dipped. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, too. I well, and then and yeah, it could. It feels like really a professional hit. That's a thirty minute window. That feels like you know she leaves. And somebody knocks on the door. But honestly, with the way that he was murdered, I guess, with the whole, like, it being in this back side of his body kind of business, what, it, mm-hmm. what that sounds like to me is honestly somebody turning to run away. That's what yeah, and, yeah, and we also have to remember that there was no signs of fourth century or, like, the valet, the first mm-hmm. person to discover him, noted that, like, it didn't look much, much of a struggle or that there, there was no broken windows, like, the door wasn't open or unlocked, like... Like, so it leads me to believe that it could potentially be someone that he He knew. Yeah. And again, yeah, like literally like, um, uh, what's her name? Mabel left and 15 minutes later is when they heard the gunshot. Huh. Literally like, I think it was also someone who was definitely like looking and like watching the property. Cause it was like that, just like, it's such a tiny time frame to squeeze it to. Like there's no way that they couldn't have been like, you know, lucky to just kind of squeeze in there without watching, you know? Yeah, yeah. and I actually feel because it was the 1920s, like, I feel like if somebody did knock on the door and it opened, they would just push their way inside, honestly. Yeah. It'd be kind of a thing. <laughs> I do. I feel like that's probably what happened. Yeah. Or the person could have knocked on the door and had the gun right there and pointed yeah. and said, let me in or I'll shoot you. Ooh, yeah. I mean, it's it, like, so it does sound like it could have been, even an amateur could have done that and something like that. I think, yeah, it sounds a little bit more, I don't think it was a random act of violence. I no, think it definitely. was planned. Oh, definitely not. Yeah. That's, that's too much small of a window. It was definitely planned. Yeah. Yeah. And I also don't think it was, um, even though a lot of websites think it's um, Mabel, I don't think it was Mabel. I don't, yeah. she, I don't to me, she doesn't have a motive. I, I don't see a motive either. And especially if the letters weren't super incriminating that the ones that were released. I don't know. I don't see a motive from her. Um, I would want to know, this is what I would want to know. And they probably wouldn't have done this at the time, but I would want to know the bullet trajectory. 
that would have kind of been an indication of height and all that other good stuff and kind of what was happening at the time. To yeah, all, all, I, all I read was that it was in like the back side and it was kind of angled like upwards a little bit. Huh. Hmm. Yeah. It was Mabel. Screw Mabel. It was her. It was <laughs> yeah. Coco's just going to accuse that everyone. Bitch. It was fucking her. <laughs> so F that bitch. It's her. No. <laughs> also, it was actually something I do want to mention also is that Mabel um, was quoted as saying that even if the letters were found, she wouldn't care if people read them. Oh. Hmm. So it was more of like, I think it was more of like the movie studio, like, again, not wanting to like be like sexy or whatever. Yeah. I get yeah. that. So listeners in the comments, let us know who you think it is. Yeah, there were a number of suspects. There's a number of suspects. I mean, you're not going to obviously know who ultimately it was, but we want to hear from you all about who you think it could have been. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with me that it was everyone? Can cahoots together? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually think think it is. said it was Lady Gaga. <laughs> yeah. She's from, she's from the past. Remember? She was like, she was, she is such a crusader for LGBT rights. I think she yeah. went back in the day and she was like, stop being closeted. Yeah. And then just took him out. You Jeez. know what? I, wasn't American Horror Story Hotel a documentary and not a, a work of fiction? <laughs> so <laughs> it, the timeline adds up. The Countess. It does. It really epic. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Shandy, we want to thank you for being on tonight with us. Yeah, and um, we're going to try to do true crime more often. So we would like to invite you to do this more with us because, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we love doing true crime. So yeah, we're thinking we might do once a month or once every other month. We're trying to mm -hmm. figure out how the timeline works. Uh, we were going to yeah. separate series, but we decided to keep it part of the same series. Yeah. Mainly because we're a little lazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Basically. The, um, yeah, I was going to say, I have like a whole like cornucopia of like true crime, like up in my true, like true crime, unsolved crime, alien shit. Like I got it all. Awesome. Yay, that's exciting. Aliens are real and they have come to our fucking earth. I'm just saying. That's true. I just had this conversation with my mom on the phone tonight. That's crazy. <laughs> So. Which, is your mom pro or um, anti-alien? Pro. She's like, they're real. Oh. They're just too fast and we haven't seen all of them. And I was like, I agree. I agree completely. Oh, I fully agree. This, yeah. If this civilization, like we can barely like go to the moon. Like if this civilization yeah. can fully visit our planet, like they figured out a way to do it like discreetly. Oh, and, oh, the, yeah. and the Pentagon documents that have been released on it just this year. Yeah, this that's right. Oh my God. Bitch, yeah. have you seen Hangar 1? No on netflix oh highly recommend it basically just like dives into all of those files in detail and like Damn. wow bitch it, aliens are real they've been here they've totally they are been here. they are i don't want to cut it short but we are at our hour so. yes we are we are at our time limit so thank you everyone for tuning in this week my name is donatella my secrets my name's coco gem holiday i'm what or shandy evans <laughs> <laughs> you're what <laughs> i'm what shandy evans <laughs> Thanks you everybody. heard it here, everyone. Shandy Evans is wet. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> this has been another episode of A Gem of a Secret Podcast. The hosts of A Gem of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Jim Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Jim Holiday at Coco Jim Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at the Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a j e m of a secret podcast. Dot com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>